we will now move on to the next uh, session which is a panel discussion on open science open science originated in the 17th century with the publication of scientific journals the movement of open science gained significant momentum particularly in the last 3 decades in india open science is strongly highlighted in the new indian science technology and innovation policy while europe aims to build a holistic framework on open science This roundtable will attempt to identify a, a first possible axis of collaboration between Europe and India. To begin the discussion, we have with us Dr. Kasturi Mandal, Principal Scientist and Head of Global Governance, and Dr. Shrini Kaveri, Director of French National Center for Scientific Research in India, Embassy of France. Uh, Dr. Kasturi, over to you now. Sorry, we can't listen to you. Are you on mute? On mute, please. Sorry, sorry for that. Thanks, Rajni. Welcome you all to this very interesting panel discussion on open science. Today we have amongst us an extremely distinguished panel. Our panelists are Dr. Rani von Schomberg from European Commission, Brussels. Dr Sanjeev Kumar Varshney Department of Science and Technology Delhi Dr Sylvie Rousse French National Center for Scientific Research CNRS Paris Dr Geeta Vani Rayasam from Council of Scientific and Industrial Research CSIR Delhi Dr Banwa Pair from CNRS New York and Dr Dr Akhilesh Gupta from Department of Science and Technology Delhi over to you Srini um thank you thank you very much uh, Kasturi and uh, first of all I would like to thank the organizers of the knowledge summit um for having given us this opportunity to discuss open science which is a very important topic with all these experts whom I thank uh, profusely for being with us today open access is an extremely important and more than ever urgent topic and it is here to stay However, despite significant progress and efforts, there are still barriers left. There are barriers exist. The lacuna in the understanding of open access still exist. So to work openly and collaboratively, there is a need for awareness on open access. Therefore, in this session, we would like to know where we stand regarding open access. What are the hurdles if any and where do we go from here? to achieve open access with an emphasis on concrete ideas on the mechanisms of indo eu collaborations on open access but before that um, let me start with a couple of observations see in a debate conducted by cnrs about 3 years ago during the 80th anniversary celebrations in paris this movement of open science and open access was referred to as a revolution in the making and in the same round table professor uh, shekhar mande the director general of csir india he said there is a bizarre situation he said a scientist in a state funded organization works on an idea and where in the institution or the university provides all the infrastructure fundings and sends the results for publication it is reviewed by fellow scientists without being paid for the job and once the paper is accepted the scientist hands over the copyright to the publisher Shaker said that this bizarre situation has to stop. Last year, Professor Vijay Raghavan, the principal scientific advisor, said users should not have to pay again and again to access scholarly communication. That fortress of access has to crumble. Now, mind you, this was before the pandemic. The pandemic probably provided the most compelling evidence in support of open science. So with this let's see whether the there is still revolution in the making and has this situation about the bizarre situation has stopped so to address this would like to invite the panelists to express their views on these are three sub questions the current state and latest developments in open access and if we consider that we have not achieved our goal of open access then why not 
what are the major hurdles and challenges in implementing open access policy and how could we incentivize the scientists so to address these questions first i would like to invite uh, rene von schomberg rene you are a philosopher you are an author and co you know co editor of 14 books you have been a european fellow at Cal uh, george mason university usa in 2007 you have been the European Commission. You have been in the, with the European Commission since 1998. You are the guest professor at the Technical University of Darmstadt, and you are also the first editor of the International Handbook of Responsible Innovation. Rane, over to you for your thoughts, please. Yes. Good. Uh, good afternoon to uh, my uh, honourable colleagues in India, and good morning in uh, Europe. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this uh, panel. And um, indeed, uh, what has been said before, COVID has been uh, an enormous uh, stimulus for open science. <clears throat> let me first, you know, let me immediately um, respond uh, to the uh, to the issues raised uh, in the introduction. That there are the right questions, I believe. Um, well, in, in case of uh, the European Union, we uh, have advanced on open access to some extent. Of course, uh, open access to publication is obligatory since 2014 for all um, funded, publicly funded research under the European Framework Program. Um, but there is some deeper uh, issues which has to do with um, uh, incentivizing and rewarding researchers to practice open science. And uh, one open access to publications and also open access to data is only one aspect of uh, open uh, of open science, uh, and an important aspect. Uh, and there has been a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, also, open data is now mandatory under Horizon uh, or under Horizon Europe. Um, but um, uh, we have seen something else uh, which has been important for open science in the case of COVID, and that is uh, open collaboration. Uh, we have to incentivize research more to collaborate together and not just uh, publish their uh, material in an open way, but also share their data and knowledge already prior to uh, publication. Um, so that means uh, cooperation and, um, and uh, uh, sharing of data in research is, is, is enormously important as COVID as illustrated, if we would not have done that in the case of COVID, we would not have uh, had uh, so quickly these vaccines. Um, so, but there is a barrier because uh, researchers nowadays, they are not rewarded for sharing their data early. They might lose their originality in terms of publishing something. Um, they might uh, uh, lose the opportunity to um, to publish in high impact journals, which uh, which on which their prestige is based on, and this has all has to change. At the European level, we have started since 2016 with all major stakeholders in the terms of an open science policy platform, with all univer big university associations and 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 publishers and all stakeholders, in fact to work together to a new uh, uh, rewards and incentive system for researchers. And this process goes very slowly um, uh, because um, there is a, a still a dilemma for researchers, especially for young researchers to engage with open science. Um, but in short, I would say we have to reward uh, more cooperation. And so in other words, we have to start rewarding research behavior rather than rewarding research outputs. Uh, so the emphasis will have to shift. Um, this means also an, 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 uh, an, re, um, an upheaval of the uh, reward system as such in terms of we have to go away from a two quantitative approach that, that uh, researchers are rewarded on the number of publications, for example, or the number of their citations. Uh, it will be more important to look to uh, the quality of their publications as such and, uh, and a qualitative uh, approach because uh, a published or Paris uh, uh, system um, may lead to enormous productive resources in terms of uh, publishing a lot, 
but the scientific system actually erodes. Uh, and and this is this is uh, the the other challenge we are currently working on. So let me leave it by that. I, I can, if if there is time, I can share some slides on uh, on general on, on the general issues of open science in Europe, if this is useful. But I just wanted to respond immediately to the questions uh, raised in the introduction. Thank you very much for your attention. Kasturi. Thank you, Rena, for sharing your thoughts with us. Now we have with us Dr. Akhilesh Gupta. Dr. Gupta, you are the Senior Advisor and Head of the Policy Coordination and Program Management Division DST. You have held several important portfolios of the Government of India as the Advisor to the Union Minister of Science and Technology and Earth Sciences, Advisor and Head of the Climate Change Program of DST, implementing two national missions on climate change. Over to you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, is my slide visible on the screen? Yes, it's visible. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, first of all, I think without any uh, uh, introduction to the subject, which is already in fact very, uh, uh, you know, this is described in detail, uh, I would straight away go to the issues. Uh, I think uh, uh, in India, of course, we uh, had been pursuing the open access policy for some time, but uh, in recent time, you know, in uh, last year, uh, we had in fact uh, taken up a major uh, work of formulating the India's hit science and technology innovation policy. And I led the secretariat of uh, uh, formulation and the open science is, in fact, uh, is the central part of uh, this uh, discussion and has prominently uh, get uh, position in the in the policy. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, the open data from publicly funded uh, research has already been there since two thousand fourteen. But the uh, now the science and technology innovation policy is going further beyond those things and bringing all kind of uh, sharing of knowledge, data, facilities, infrastructure, including access to journals, and all uh, providing libraries and open learning spaces and open educational. Uh, resources and all that we in tech are, have been brought as a part of this policy. Also, in addition to this, that you know, we, we have brought as a part of this open access the better integration of science and society, recognition of traditional knowledge system, and also participation of other stakeholders uh, to, to get benefit out of the access. Fund. Now, some of the important points on the Indian perspective is I am just trying to present before you is that, you know, as I said, the DST and DVT already had open access policy uh, and that was uh, put in place in 2014, uh, where the primary objective was to achieve uh, green open access. Uh, but the success has been limited uh, so far. And the, uh, but in the uh, new policy on science and technology, we are bringing up a major uh, intervention uh, that is one nation, one subscription model, where, you know, the, instead of institutions and individual paying for subscription of uh, journals, the price will be centrally negotiated and access will be provided to one and all. So this will create a, a, a kind of a complete democratization of uh, this science in terms of complete access to all users of uh, researchers in the country. Uh, this uh, actually also get connected with the cultural changes. It's not just that institutional changes will make this happen. We need some kind of uh, you know, in, 
some kind of uh, cognitive awareness uh, is required, you know, and understanding of the open access because most of the people have no idea about the uh, the open access and and therefore uh, a lot of work need to be done for this. Uh, Social economic differences need to be understood. See, for example, we need to understand the policies of open open access in uh, in in European countries and India. So we have a different kind of uh, ecosystem. So, for example, the uh, uh, the one nation one subscription is is something which we can implement. Uh, but you know, when it comes to LTC. There are issues coming up in, from India, and of course, we are very uh, much in, in, uh, interested to implement APC. But you know, I think there are some uh, kind of socio-economic problems we have. Also, so therefore, the plan S is we are not getting aligned uh, currently. I mean, we don't know in future it may happen. And ONOS proposal is in fact getting ready. And we are in the office of PSA and DST are working together on this, uh, how to go forward. Of course, the open access and open science both have created a lot of impact uh, on institutions and individuals. And uh, now the, uh, the lack to open uh, space is, is in fact, the scientists are also trying to uh, recognize the importance of this. And it is, in fact, uh, society is getting uh, largely impacted. For example, citizen science is getting popular in India, and we are, in fact, already in, the funding agencies are now coming forward and uh, giving support for the citizen science. Uh, the uh, issue uh, which was uh, raised in the beginning that, you know, the COVID time, you no, know, in fact, the, sort of so much of change has happened. For example, uh, there were initiatives to openly share the preprints in the COVID time, and the uh, commercial publishers also came forward and they helped doing this kind of, uh, you know, uh, helping the open science. And, and this has, and in fact, in terms of sharing our research information on vaccine and other uh, issues, are also being very uh, useful during the COVID. So there. I think there's a there's a kind of change that has taken place during the uh, during the COVID time, and that must be appreciated both from the user's point of view and also from the from the commercial point of view. There is a demand going uh, kind of uh, going on on the open access in the humanities and social sciences. Of course, the uh, humanities and social sciences, the most of the literature. I mean, I would say majority of the literature is not in terms of journals uh, or the research papers. They are published in, uh, in the books and their literature. And of course, there are initiatives which are to put the books also as open, uh, as part of the open access. So I would say that the, the India is trying to align its uh, policy with the international, in fact, we participated in the UNESCO deliberations and I think uh, there are issues like, for example, the conflict between the, uh, uh, you know, IPR and open access. I think there, there are some conflicts uh, uh, and we try to, to raise that in the, in the uh, UNESCO, but, you know, it's still an issue because the, the, uh, the open access discourages to some extent the commercial Again, uh, that uh, that somebody gets to the I get. I think I would uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, am I audible? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Akhilesh, and I also would like to thank uh, Rane. So, uh, very quick resume of what we heard so far. So, one, uh, Rane, you clearly mentioned that there has to be a paradigm shift. And that's not going to be so easy and it is going to take some time because if we have to find the ways of rewarding the scientific behavior more than the scientific results and the publications, 
that is going to take some effort but that's very interesting move and i also thank uh, akhilesh for having brought up quite a few issues you brought up about the social economic uh, setup and then you talked about the one nation one subscription but we have some more questions afterwards and the importance of covid uh, in terms of vaccines both rane and uh, akhilesh you mentioned and regarding uh, the social sciences i also had a question i'll come back to that later but with this little background now can we now move on to uh, you know we heard about dst we heard from the european union i would like to shift now the gears towards cnrs national center for scientific research uh, may i invite uh, dr silvi rusay uh, silvi you are the director of the open science and open research data department at cnrs named ddor you are a senior researcher at cnrs in the field of nanoscience in 2014 you were appointed as the vice president in charge of research at the university paris didro and in november 2018 you took over as the director of the cnrs scientific and technical information department which is now called as the ddor i invite you to express your views on where we stand and what are the incentivized incentives that you propose over to you um, sir yes <clears throat> hello everybody thank you very much um i try to share my screen uh if you can see my slides so um oh okay just uh, we can see your screen you can see it right? yes yes i have to yeah full screen yes yes yeah we got it so can you see the second slide i want just to recall briefly uh where we are for yes. open science in france and cnrs yes um uh, we had created as soon as 2001 and uh, we are celebrating today the 20 years of hal um it's a national open archive and nowadays there is a 137 institutional repository in each uh, institutional institution in France and this was helped uh, recently more recently by the digital republic law uh, in October 2016 because now it's uh, a law that um, help to to keep the right for the author and when his research is um, founded by a um, public um uh, funds then they they are allowed to to deposit their manuscript on the open archive whatever the contract with the publisher is so it 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 help a lot um or researcher to deposit their manuscript in in the open archive and now in france we have also a national plan for open science first version in july 2018 second version in 2021 and i will come back also about the the plan s that the, the national french agency signed in september 2018 i think it's only the the article processing charge that are promoted by the plan s nowadays it has changed a little so uh, for cnrs we have an open science policy you could find on our website you can find on our website the english version of our cnrs roadmap on open science and last year we we launched a cnrs research data plan um now in this brief uh, first turn i would just talk about um um our, our objective of 100% of open access for publication and the global strategy is the biodiversity i think we are not far from uh what was promoted by india in the, in the first um talk so these are a few key features about our scientific publication at cnrs uh, about 47000 article per year and you have also the cost about uh, 12 plus 2 uh, million of euro for cnrs and if you look at france for france the numbers are about 100000 article and the cost is 100 million of euro but this cost is is coming more and more important and of course it become not uh, more uh, sustainable um where where we are now for open access at cnrs uh, we have 
percent of open access from our publication and what is the way the open access is is proposed it's mainly via the open archive so i want to insist about that this route is very uh, successful here both in in in, in france or at cnrs so just to remind there are several routes that are proposed by plan s nowadays we are not we do not agree the cnrs do not make the promotion of the gold route we don't want to pay open access with article processing charge i should say that very clearly but rather we encourage the green route or also the diamond route where you can have some open uh, access platform where you don't need to pay in order to publish in open access so just to to show what this open archives repository hall it looks like that on the website and here you can see that we have made uh, strong commitments uh, to our researcher in order to um, to oblige in a sense them to deposit in hall in the open archive and if you see this curve it's it's really uh, going up uh, much more strongly starting in 2018 2020 and nowadays in 2021 we see that the deposit with the manuscript is even higher than without the manuscript so i think we were quite successful with this commitment and we will continue in this direction maybe i don't want to talk too long but just to say that there are other ways to publish in an access not only the open archive but also we want to to in enhance alternatives like open edition and the AP review are also this is a diamond approach which will be very um, interesting in, in the future so um, I think I will stop here and also we have strategy for um, open data and and assessment but maybe it will come later in the discussion thank you very much thank you Sylvie for letting us know about the open science policy at CNRS and for France. May I now invite Dr. Geeta Vani Rayasam. Dr. Rayasam, you are the head of the Science Communication and Dissemination Directorate at CSIR. Your interest is in new drug discovery. You have a rich experience of working in pharmaceutical industry and leading the CSIR's open source drug discovery project on tuberculosis. You are presently leading the efforts of strengthening CSIR's alliance with industry. Dr. Rayasam, please. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. It's a very interesting and uh, topic. And I think no knowledge summit would be complete without a discussion on open science, I think. Uh, so it's a very uh, important topic. And already the panelists before me have almost echoed my sentiments. I think uh, in a topic like this, it's kind of, we all seem to agree upon what's required. And I think to the audience, whoever is there, I think, I don't need to explain what are the benefits of open science or open access. I would just like to share a couple of uh, my thoughts on this. At first, at the institutional level, I think we are very much aligned to what uh, Dr. Gupta presented in terms of uh, the government of India's policies on One Nation, One Subscription. And uh, so pretty much uh, CSIR, the organization, is aligned to what uh, the government is working on that. So on that, we do not differ. Uh, the only point is uh, CSIR had an open access policy way back in 2011. So the point I'd like to highlight is having policy is one thing, but implementation is another key challenge. Uh, that's something which I think uh, we need to deliberate upon. Uh, yes, first the first step is the policy, but then how do you ensure that it is implemented? That is, I think, a challenge. And as my previous speakers highlighted, Perhaps uh, the pandemic is an opportunity because it's given impetus uh, to talk about open science and open publications. And we all, um, and during the you know calamity, many things are pushed and we've seen increased acceptance. But the question is, is it going to last beyond the pandemic? How do we utilize this increased interest in openness of data sharing, collaborations and science be sustained beyond the pandemic? I think that's something we need to, as a community of scientific uh, scientists and policy makers, uh, we need to develop on is how do we harness this interest uh, in this? 
And a couple of thoughts uh, which I would like to highlight is, uh, I'm a biologist by training and uh, I've seen that, you know, there are preprint servers which have been there, uh, say in physics, it's very well accepted uh, to post on the physical archives and it's very well accepted in the community. But biologists by and large were not a part of this uh, preprint servers and archives. But what's happened is during this pandemic, uh, now a lot of people have been uh, publishing their preprints and uh, preprint servers such as BioArchive or MedArchive and tremendous increase in the publications. So I think this could be an alternative model or you know one could look at uh, can we, is it a sustainable model? But again, I would like to draw that own uh, challenges as well uh, because when you talk about preprint, uh, you're just putting out the publication and we all know that a peer review process really brings in the required rigor to the data and the quality control which may not be there in a preprint. So when you uh, advocate for a preprint server as uh, one of the models for open exchange of information, one also has to be careful about the standards uh, which are going to be implemented. And But having said that, I think uh, again, during the pandemic, we've seen that there were some papers which had some claims which were not tenable, but then they were corrected by the community. Uh, so I think there are inherent mechanisms uh, by the transparency, which may lead to correction of uh, some of these things. But then again, uh, the challenge which I foresee is that there may be areas where the public may not take an interest in. So, but that data, if somebody is assuming that it's on a preprint server, okay, let's use this data going forward. So it could lead to uh, some erroneous uh, science and hypothesis. So that I think is a challenge. So how do we address these challenges is something which we need to look up and uh, so that is I think one of the key parameters and another parameter which I borrow from my previous panelists is research behavior versus research output but again you know how do you quantify research behavior because it's easier to quantify research output but not behavior so how do we incentivize people for sharing their data and again I think uh, coming back to policy unless you make it mandatory that you know you're granting you're receiving the grant is subject to you know posting this, unless we perhaps come around and implement such policies, we may not. And it's not only carrot model, I think you need a carrot also, you need incentives also, it's not just a stick. So I think that's where a balanced and a nuanced view has to be taken uh, when you talk of open access publications. And the last point is, again, openness is a, there's a degree of openness. And uh, another point which I would like to highlight is, during the pandemic, uh, many industries came up and said, you know, our antlers the property uh, is available and it's open but then again the point is unless you share the data real data it's not there's no value in that again openness uh, just for the sake of openness may not be meaningful and that's another area i think uh, when we're talking of openness what's important is this data and there is increasing focus on metadata and algorithms and we are in a digital age now how do you go beyond uh, open publications to open science. And I think, uh, again, we are fortunate to be in a digital age. So there's uh, we can use these digital technologies and uh, utilize these digital technologies actually to move into the open science realm. But then again, it's a balancing act, I think, where we need to take care of privacy and intellectual property and sensitivities around that, and then uh, move them forward. And these are my initial comments, and uh, we'll be open for discussion further ahead. I think you're muted, uh, Dr. Kaveri. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Geeta. Um, now, before we go on, I just would like to make a quick resume of what we heard from uh, Sylvie and uh, your, yourself, because very interesting points. Uh, Sylvie has been interesting. I have listened to her three years ago about the plan S and how uh, you know it's important not to pay two times. I mean, the, the institutions pay to the publishers, the scientists would have to pay to the publishers. And so uh, she is extremely uh, firm on that particular aspect, 
we'll come back to that regarding the article processing charges uh, but then uh, you brought up the point about the gap between policy making and implementation there are two ball games different different ball games i mean i know how important it is to i mean to make the policy but also take to take it to the implementation level we are talking a different ball game but then we'll come back to that also and uh, the data science i mean open science we are not there yet let's go step by step and then we are once again talking about data it's a very interesting issue i hope we'll have some time to come back to that but now um, to continue with this discussions on where we stand i would uh, like to invite banwa pierre uh, banwa you are a research director in fluid mechanics and acoustics laboratory in cnrs in lyon you are actively involved in the promotion of open science on behalf of cnrs and also on behalf of the french ministry of education and research could you please share your thoughts about where we stand thank you okay uh, thank you can you yes we can hear you can hear we can see you okay uh, thanks so i try to to briefly share my experience to as a researcher trying to promote the, uh, open access so there will be some overlap with the previous, uh, previous talks but uh, uh, obviously there so that means that you're on same lines uh, all together so my research is in um, fluid dynamics <clears throat> so in france fluid dynamics is classified among the, the engineering sciences while uh, in the engineering speaking world is generally considered as a branch of mathematics and so i think that's very interesting because uh, mathematics is probably among the, the most advanced uh, on the question of open access, while uh, engineering sciences we are often considered as really the, the last in the class on, on this on this topic. <laughs> so this gives me, I think, a very good view on the diversity of attitudes towards uh, towards open access. And um, yes, as you mentioned, so in parallel with my um, research um, activities, I am consider myself as a long-term activist on, on open science um, so within CNRS so I am open access advisor for the, the Institute of Engineering Sciences so which is one of the 10 institutes of uh, CNRS and so directly working with um, Sylvie Rousset which is the uh, present here directed of, uh, director of the DIDOR department and so within the French Ministry of Education and Research so I'm a member of the, the COSO the committee for open science so this committee is in charge of the um, of implementing the French national plan for, for open science and more specifically so I'm chairing the work group on non-publications in that uh, in that committee um, so I believe that for us scientists in France so the very very important milestone was the the loi pour une république numérique so the bill for a digital republic mentioned by Sylvie already so voted in 2016 so after a wider public uh, consultation and indeed this consultation triggered a lot of input and um, awareness among the, the research uh, community and uh, we at uh, the CNRS uh, we contributed to the rephrasing of one of the, the particular uh, items uh, which now so allows us to deposit an author accepted manuscript in an open archive after an embargo period of no more than six months in, in, in my field and uh, even uh, if the author has signed an, an exclusive copyright transfer agreement to the, the commercial publisher so this means that uh, if, uh, from that point on the green self archiving route towards 100 percent open access is, is now possible provided of course the authors do the, the self archiving and um, so obviously this um, digital bill is a big step forward but it's, it's not enough since it does not lift uh, the potential remaining embargo of the six, uh, six months uh, window where, where we still can't deposit our, our, our manuscripts. And uh, so in order um, to, to achieve an immediate open access to all publications, so we still need to implement, for example, but that's uh, I think one of the best ways is the, the rights retention strategy as advocated, uh, for example, by the, the European planners. So the European planners not only uh, we are rather in favor of this uh, part than uh, in paying uh, APCs and come back to it later. So basically this rights uh, retention strategy uh, consists in applying a Creative Commons license to, to our manuscripts before submitting them to, uh, to a journal. So of course this uh, requires uh, awareness from the authors and uh, at the same time uh, incentives by uh, our institutions and uh, uh, funding uh, uh, agencies. And um, so finally, I, I think very important point I want to come back to that again is the, the, the problem of APCs. So author charges uh, to make the papers open access on the publisher's websites. So this becomes more and more a common practice. 
but uh, in France, we clearly, as already mentioned by, by Sylvie, so we clearly discourage paying APCs uh, for essentially for three reasons. Huh? Because they are non-ethical, they are over-expensive, and even they uh, worsen the, the problem. So why are they non-ethical? So if you pay to get published, uh, there's definitely a conflict of interest. Huh? So that's, I think, one of the major reasons to, to avoid them. Uh, they are over-expensive. Uh, the amount that you have to pay is, uh, in general, much more than a real cost of processing or, or publication. Um, and um, the prices they may skyrocket for journals that are considered to be prestigious. So really, I always think that APC stands for Article Prestige Charges and not, uh, has not, nothing to do with, with, with processing charges. So and the, the price of these APCs, so it's not only a problem for uh, so-called uh, emerging countries, it's unsustainable for us all. So for, for CNRS, it would uh, involve uh, almost a tenfold increase in what we pay to, to access publications if you were to switch from a uh, reader-based model to an author-based model. So really, it's, it's um, unsustainable. And the idea that there is enough money in the system to make this transition from a reader-based to author-based, that's, that's a clear mis misconception. Uh, so, uh, so APCs are, I think, non-ethical, over-expensive, and they even worsen the problem uh, that we are at the mercy of uh, greedy uh, commercial publishers. Indeed, so if subscriptions become too expensive, uh, we can always cancel the subscriptions. But if the APCs become too expensive, we can no longer publish our research. And so it really threatens uh, academic freedom. So, uh, yeah, maybe to, to wrap up, let's say the three points I want to make so that APCs should be avoided for. It's a, a cure worse than the, the disease. So in France, we have the uh, Loi pour une République Numérique, which enables the green route to, to open access. But I understand that in, in India, there is not yet uh, such, a, uh, such a provision. But um, anyway, uh, the rights uh, retention strategy is available to anyone. So its implementation, of course, requires a few efforts from, from the author. So it's maybe not uh, straightforward, but it, it's worth the, the effort because it will enable uh, immediate open access to all publications that know extra costs. So I think it's really wor worth to, um, to work together to such a uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bango. I know that you are a fighter. You have been advocating very, very seriously about uh, the APC and about the archives. And I'll come back to archives in a second. But the story of a non-ethical issue you know, article processing charge being uh, non-ethical is so important and you are not the only one I have read and I have listened to many people even in India how vehemently they oppose this, um, this non-ethical practice and not only expensive, that is a big problem obviously, but ethics in science is so important. So that will probably have to discuss much more uh, in detail. Uh, now. Uh, this automatically brings us towards very important issue and that is regarding the open access repositories. We started talking about it gently but then as we are running short of time we I would invite a brief remarks from our panelists on um, how to develop open access policies uh, which take into account the economic inequalities. This is equally important in economic inequalities uh, among the countries and institutions. And for this, may I uh, re invite Rane from the European side and Akhilesh, please? Uh, so, over to you, Rane. So, we are talking about the open access repositories and archives and um, economic inequalities. Please, Rane. Uh, thank you, thank you, Srini. Um, that's uh, that's of course again a uh, very important issue. Um, I, I can, I mean, this this actually uh, this was uh, one of the reasons why uh, we at the European Commission have uh, set up a, a publishing platform ourselves to enable um, to uh, to enable uh, beneficiaries of our funding program to publish uh, without costs uh, uh, and uh, in a peer-reviewed manner 
on that platform. And it's not just publishing uh, publications, outcomes of research, but also preprints and, uh, and sharing information uh, early on, which is essential for open science. Uh, at the same time, of course, in the course of Plan S, which is an initiative which, um, uh, to which uh, the Commission is only an observer to, uh, and not a uh, direct, uh, not, uh, not, not, it's not, you know, it's not leading that, that initiative. Uh, we have, of course, tried to, um, to lower those costs uh, equally uh, on open access, as you mentioned, uh, for the situation in India, you have um, embarked uh, predominantly on a green open access road. Um, at the Commission side, we have always emphasized that uh, we, don't, um, uh, we don't favor a particular open access or uh, road so gold or green but that's all options for open access uh, should be um, should be considered and and certainly also the green uh, the green one um so it it is an uh, it is an issue um and and of course uh, uh, the, the the issue with the publishers is is a matter of negotiations in which uh, you know, as far as the European Union is concerned, of course, a coalition with uh, with nations uh, and, and uh, helps to put on the pressure to lower the costs. Um, I think these are the options uh, we have. We have we work, of course, also towards, um, uh, as you probably know, a European Open um, Science Cloud, which would enable uh, researchers um, in an open way to. Um, and in an interdisciplinary way to share data and publications across nations and across disciplines. Um, so that will be a national, that will be funded, uh, co-funded with, uh, with member states of the European Union. And um, uh, again, there uh, the, uh, the participation will be um, uh, supported by large uh, public funds. So that, that in the end uh, will hopefully uh, contribute to a more equitable situation. Uh, in, in the end, maybe not, not an optimal. We still have to work and think more about uh, making uh, uh, open access also internationally uh, an uh, equitable, equitable business. Thank you for your, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's, that was very interesting point about the Science Cloud and uh, um, how we can encourage uh, people to uh, go for the uh, repositories etc. Now, see, if you are talking about Science Cloud, this is all interesting, but can you imagine a country with a very minimum or very uh, least fundings for research? How would they be able to do that? This is going to be a big problem. Uh, I don't know whether you want to answer this is slightly provocative if you are talking about uh, I, don't, I don't want to name any country but in, in a poor country who do not even have a prop, you know, appropriate internet services or even uh, um, the basic facilities if you are talking about depositing in uh, science cloud uh, the clouds how is it going to work you want to answer that quickly or even yes uh, I quickly? think um uh, I, I cannot give the ultimate answer, but I can give you the considerations we have. I mean, one consideration is, I think uh, it's not the cost which is the major consideration here, but the reciprocity between countries in, in terms of a commitment of contributing to such an open science cloud. So if, if a country says, I want to participate, that means that um, you, you should, you, we know if you put data, if you want to take data, let's say, or publication out of the cloud, you should also put your own stuff in. So that, that's, that's the idea, reciprocity. So, um, and there, uh, if you want to distinguish richer and less rich countries, it's not so relevant because it's more the reciprocity which is important there. Um, so I, I think, so this is what, what one, one can address in, in what we call in the rules of participation in the cloud. I think the ultimate answer has not been given yet, but I think this is a major consideration, uh, the reciprocity uh, element. Um, and then, you know, uh, so, so I think uh, uh, obviously the research infrastructures uh, uh, cost something, but uh, I mean, the financing of um, the European uh, Science Cloud is of course in, uh, in, in European uh, business. So in, in that sense, uh, 
I, I don't think there will be um, if we internationalize. Uh, there has not been uh, direct considerations on, on charging uh, on charging uh, people for this. So, but it's more because the idea of openness means, of course, open open access, and uh, so you want to, um, to 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 enable uh, sharing, as we did with the COVID platform. By the way, the COVID platform was a precursor, which has uh, millions of researchers that put their data in there and took it out of there in an in an, a really global effort. So it's it's not about um, so cost were that not an, uh, a a direct issue there, but reciprocity is. Yes, thank you, thank you, Vane. Um That makes sense. Uh, see, we heard from Sylvie about the the HAL system, the HAL system, and uh, that's why I would like to see what Akhilesh Gupta would say regarding the repositories and uh, the, the the position or the stand of India on repositories or archives. Uh, if you can give a brief answer akhilesh i would appreciate that yeah thank you uh, thank you shini uh, uh, see, uh, we did have a repository in terms of you know uh, say we have isti portal we have istm portal and, and there are more portal say portal by csir and other institutions so these portals are available in a scattered way and they are like positioning various kind of input uh, in terms of uh, open access but now i think uh, what we are planning is a, a kind of uh, a national repository what we call it sti observatory which will contain uh, everything uh, as a part of the open access uh, we it you know all in, uh, uh, the data the uh, Uh, the uh, project uh, which have been sectioned, the outcome, the report card, the the research card, the uh, the even the uh, uh, the all, uh, all uh, thesis are coming out of the post graduation and TED. So this STI entity is going to be one stock shop for every access that uh, one needs here. Uh, we have this plan as a part of the STI policy, and as soon as, soon as the policy is in, is a, is a, what is called approved, we will start working. And this is a, as I said, you know, the office of PSA and DST are working, and along with other department, DGT and CSIR will work together for this uh, STI observatory. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Akhilesh. Uh, Banwa Pierre has a point uh, to make. Please, Banwa. Yes, thanks. Yeah, actually, I was just wondering how do you, of course, in India, there are a lot of uh, repositories which can allow you to deposit uh, yes. uh, paper. So I think it's not a problem of uh, maintaining repositories. Costs some money, but it's not so expensive compared to it and different things. But how would you proceed to allow people to? really deposit their papers because the version of records most of the time you are not allowed the, the green route also has quite a few of, of problems if uh, the authors have um, uh, given away let's say they, they transferred their copyrights and so on so what in france we have this law pour une république numérique which allows us to deposit even if we have given away our, our rights so what could you do in, in, in india to really promote uh, open access beyond what is already openly available at the, the publishers. Yeah, I think that will be a, a challenge for us also. And uh, but what we are uh, contemplating is there some kind of a policy that every researcher using uh, uh, part of uh, the fellowship uh, provided by government uh, must have the uh, kind of uh, obligation to submit that to this uh, portal and uh, and in lieu it, he gets uh, or she gets all the access so i think it is a uh, it is going to be in the larger interest of the researcher but i think you are right that you know we need some kind of policy in position otherwise you know uh, unless we if you make it uh, very voluntary it may not be possible so you need to have some kind of uh, policy to insist researcher to deposit 
uh, this kind of their all their uh, research uh, research and other uh, project. Uh, for example, thesis is one area. Of course, we are already doing thesis is already being done. There is a central repository for thesis in the in the country that we already do, and it is part of the uh, university mandate that every research researcher which uh, work with the ministry, university has to deposit at the uh, central. So this uh, and research could also we will insist on that. So I think is uh, we are in the process of evolving that system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akhilesh. Uh, if you allow me now, um, I would like to go to a very, very important aspect. Okay. I mean, not that it was not important what we discussed, but uh, uh, you see the very philosophy of the Knowledge Summit. We are in, in the framework of the Knowledge Summit here, Indo-French Knowledge Summit. We'll also include Europe, of, obviously. Now, the very philosophy of the Knowledge Summit is to foster collaborations. And we heard clearly from Gita and uh, from others also that, uh, yeah, from, yeah, you, uh, Akhilesh, you also mentioned that, uh, and Rane, you mentioned that there is, there has to be a shift in the behavior, research behavior. You had, you also mentioned about awareness because we clearly understood that the awareness is not really there. It's not there. I mean, despite all this effort. Now, could we point out, please, uh, um, may I invite all of you to say a few words about how can we collaborate, uh, you know, concrete mechanisms of collaboration, not just at the you know, government level, policy level, but uh, as Gita said, implementation level. Could we think of some innovative ideas of promoting collaboration between Europe, France obviously, and India, please. Um, well, I start with Gita first, if you don't mind. Gita? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a tough question. You're asking something. I'm me. sorry. I'm sorry. But then we need to get some something extract out of you. You know, I need to get something out of you. Please. To everyone, from, from everyone, actually. Yeah, I think there's no need to emphasize on the need for collaboration and openness. I think first step is the openness. Many times we are not even aware. Like I'll just give an example. Many times we are not aware who are the people working in our area. Like, okay, you may know your direct uh, collaborators, at your large extent, you may know the people in the field, but very often somebody from a very diverse field of expertise may even be able to give you better inputs so of what you call crowdsourcing or, you know, getting the ideas from people. So that kind of open, uh, I think, open science space for collaboration. That's the first step, I think. And all these steps we discussed will definitely pave the culture of collaboration to begin with and also the advantage of repositories what we are talking about if these repositories can be a larger database like i had worked on a project earlier where you, know, you have this database suppose i key in the word for example i'm working on one particular biomedical device and i would like to know who are the people working on that be it in france be it in india okay you do a pubmed search you get papers but you know beyond that what are their areas? So you can have built platforms. And I think now we have digital technologies where you can have collaborative platforms, where you can use this data, this open access data and search for people. And then you, you can talk to them, you know, online. And nowadays you don't even need a physical uh, visits. And thanks to COVID, we are all very well versed with this collaborative tools. So can we utilize these tools for enhanced cooperation? Thanks. Um, uh, Kasturi, you want to ask a question to uh, Sylvie about collaboration? <laughs> Sylvie, I would really appreciate uh, what, what you know, from CNRS, coming from CNRS, what could you propose as a part, you know, uh, concrete mechanism of collaboration, please? Yes, thank you. As a concrete uh, point, I would say that we have this very nice uh, CEFI Prague collaborative research program. Yes. So, as a first step, we could use it um, so that the the publication uh, from uh, this project should be as a mandatory should be deposited or should be open access. It could be deposited in the French Open Archive if necessary. Or we can discuss about how we can collaborate in this way. And then I think we could enlarge this proposition that maybe there is some collaboration to make with uh, our own open repository, HAL, this archive. It's, it's open to, 
to Indian researcher if they wants to deposit their manuscripts. So I think this could be one one way of collaboration in order to foster open access. Thank you. That was brief, but to the point. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. Um, anybody else wants to come up with uh, concrete mechanisms for cooperation? Uh, Banwa, you have some ideas? Uh, actually, if CV already has said what I... She <laughs> stole your idea? <laughs> uh, that's it. Yeah, this is a project. That, that's a good, good point to start to make common uh, deposits in open archives. And I think one uh, important point so to increase the open access is also by the, let's say, evaluation of projects. So that, for, for example, by uh, calls for uh, submission of proposals that uh, people, if they put in their CV and, and so on, that uh, uh, say to encourage or maybe oblige them to only list uh, papers that are uh, available, openly openly available. Of course, they can, um, they encourage them to deposit them be before applying for, for proposals. And for example, again, the CITRIC pack could be uh, one of the, let's say, the means to, uh, to, to trigger awareness to, to, to this. You actually mentioned that even earlier, um, about when we were talking about the ethics, uh, you know, before even publishing, uh, try to, uh, you know, put it in open access. Uh, but imagine the, the plight of the scientists. I mean, what would they react? Because for a biologist like me, uh, when we do some animal studies, taking the ethical committee approval and many other such approvals. They take such a long time and sometimes it can be frustrating. It is very important, but it can be frustrating. We really have to motivate the scientists, incentivize to do this and to make it easy for the scientists. Uh, so I understand it is important, but then to get there to incentivize, it may take some effort. Uh, Rane, you want to say something, please. And then uh, thank you, thank, yeah. thank you, uh, Srini. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, for for um, just to give an example of our uh, new funding program, Horizon Europe, we we actually made an incentive uh, in under the uh, evaluation criterion of excellence. So you have normally a, a free criterion which the research proposals are evaluated under the uh, funding of the Europe uh, of Horizon uh, Europe. Uh, one is uh, is that is the excellence uh, criterion, um, but we have extended this excellent excellence criterion with open science requirements. So um, uh, it is uh, it, it you you will as a researcher uh, more chance to get funding if you uh, make clear uh, what your open science practices are. Uh, in the course of that project, and that would then also include, uh, for example, uh, ways of open collaboration within or beyond uh, science. So this is, I think, this is one important aspect uh, in getting incentives for researchers uh, in their in, for for the research funding system. Uh, I mean, funders have to uh, become proactive here. Um, and the other issue, I think, you know, you generally on your question on um, how we would advance uh, internationally, I, I think, uh, you know, indeed COVID was uh, a blessing there for us because you can say, well, what we did with the COVID uh, open science platform, for example, you can also do for all the important issues underpinning uh, sustainable development goals, because for those uh, SDCs, it's e almost equally urgent as for COVID. Uh, we have to address them in an open way and in a collaborative way. And, and that means we have to incentivize collaboration. And uh, indeed, this is possible, as previous speakers also have said, to set up platforms specifically for those issues. Uh, in, in some extent, they exist uh, in the area of climate change, for example, but um, we can do this much more rigorously. Super. Thank you very much. I mean, this is going to be a real paradigm shift. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, Sylvie, you want to say something, please? Yes. Uh, first, I, I want to say that I totally uh, I, we are in line at CNRS in France with the initiative of the European Commission on uh, the practices on uh, assessment, and we have changed our um, individual criteria of assessment to make them more qualitative and less quantitative, not using anymore the impact journal factor. 
and it is very uh, important for us and we have signed the declaration of DORA of San Francisco. So I, I think it will help a lot. And the second point, if, as you mentioned, you were a biologist, I would say that there is also more generally the, the servers of preprint, which are very important, where you can deposit your manuscript as soon as it is written, mm -hmm. then you have the, the date, it, it would count, and then, so for biologists, you have bioarchive, which is a very uh, nice preprint server where everybody can, can deposit there. Then after that, if since you, you we need some referring, my, I mean, we, we claim also that the referring by the pair is very important. Mm -hmm. Then you can have review that will pick up uh, the preprint and then there will be refer, it will be a referring process and this can lead to some uh, journal that we have this EP review in, yes. in, in the HAL Open Archive or in uh, other um, archive also. So I think it, it would be very interesting also to combine preprints of server and then the referee by, by the pair, but in, in a not the main way that the commercial publisher. Fantastic. I mean, we are really going to shift huh? because you know how important uh, at one point the impact factors were, how we were running after the impact factors and how we are going to shift that now. It's it's going to change uh, dramatically the scenario of uh, doing science. Akhilesh, uh, you wanted to uh, say something briefly. Yeah, I think uh, I will be very brief, you know, yes. uh, uh, as far as the uh, uh, India's uh, all this initiative on open science and open access concern. I think we are uh, just kind of moving in the direction of uh, adopting the open science. And I think uh, we are part of the global movement on on open science. And therefore, uh, it is uh, good that uh, we are participating in such activities. I would say that you know we get uh, immensely benefited by collaboration with uh, France on several areas. So one area is, of, of course, the uh, the archive or the, or the uh, repository. Uh, we still don't have much experience, although we have uh, so much, uh, so many other repositories, but I think we need to have an integrated view of uh, what kind of repository should have and uh, what kind of the technical and, uh, issues that are uh, that will come into this. Thing. The One Nation One Subscription also, uh, if, uh, if France has any experience and the APC uh, also, there are some experience we we'll like to learn from those experiences. One important area which was France has done and we also are now attending is the transition uh, issue because uh, we have uh, so many uh, regional languages, uh, and we will like the uh, this to be translated in C. So we already attempted a national mission has been launched for translation of STI uh, knowledge. But I think we need to uh, have more experience in this session. And the last point is uh, open science, uh, open access for the books uh, for the humanity and social sciences. So maybe uh, if there are any experiences on sharing of books uh, and the other literature, the grey literature, I think we would like to know about it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rene, you want to say something, please? No? Your hand is still up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I did not. Uh, I didn't I agree. Agree on the hand. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah. So, so now we are almost towards the end of the round table and it would be good if we could have one last word uh, from Rane on the position of European Union on Plan S and Gita, if you would like to comment on the position of India on One Nation, One Subscription Policy. Uh, you want me to go first or? Yes, Rane. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, I mean, um, as I said, uh, although uh, Plan S was initiated uh, by um, a former director general of, uh, of uh, DG Research, Plan S as such is not uh, a uh, European Commission initiative. We are only an observer. 
um, we want to uh, we will probably align with uh, with uh, with 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 plan s of course um, but we have our own policies uh, in, in place and they go further than than plan s of course and they have also a broader uh, perspective on open science so uh, i think um uh, I, I, I want to conclude, uh, of, or, or you know, I want to emphasize actually that, uh, as I said in the beginning, open access is important. Uh, equitable open access is also important. But I think the essence from open science is not just to have openness of publications, but it's about early data sharing and early knowledge sharing prior to publication. So the, the mm -hmm. emphasis of, of outputs towards research behavior, this, what I said before, this is uh, my credo for today. So thank you very much for your excellent, attention. Excellent, excellent. Gita, would you like to come in? Uh, no, I think uh, I echo what Jenny uh, just mentioned. And I think uh, like, as uh, Dr. Rakesh Gupta mentioned, we, uh, India is looking at this one nation, one subscription policy and it's an evolving uh, negotiation. And I think it's a complex negotiation because we all understand the dynamics of publication industry. It's an ambitious goal. And yeah. I hope uh, India will be really able to negotiate because I think the benefits are far, far, uh, far reaching if we really succeed in this. And I think uh, our efforts are continuing the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor and DST are leading these efforts on One Nation, One Subscription. And as we do that, I think we should also look at alternatives and uh, like Rene pointed out, not just stop at the publications, but look at the open science, the whole movement as such. It's not just restricted to publications. And I think in parallel, we also have to look at these other initiatives. How do we ensure that even preprint servers how do we ensure that our uh, scientists you know deposit this preprint service there should be a cultural shift and i like the i think we can learn something from the french exchange and you know, the best practices of both the countries and this collaborative platform is useful wherein we can see what's working in europe and can be adopted in india like you know some of our funding agencies like where, uh, where we are talking about when you submit a grant in your previous grant have you done anything on open science is that could be a parameter one of the parameters not necessarily the parameter but i think these are something which we have to look in a far-reaching way how can we do the small changes which may have a big impact uh, that i think is also one of the things which we need to look at and also this concept of you know research behavior versus outputs this is something which i think uh, could be you know examined and see how we can uh, you know tailor make it to our indian context and see how it could work Thank you, Gita. Over to you, Srini. Thank you. Um, and there are many questions, very exciting questions on the on the chat box. But can you know? I don't know how long uh, the organizers will allow. The Amruta is shaking her head as if no, no, you are bypassing the time. But this question is very provocative or interesting. Uh, I would like to shoot it. Whoever wants to answer, raise the hand quickly and answer that. See, open data is also sharing data in international collaborations between countries who sometimes do not have the same rules. How international cooperation can deal with this? This is somewhat sticky question, I guess. Who wants to answer that? We are talking about international collaboration who do not follow the same rules. Dangerous question. Sylvie, you want to say go for it on something? No, you don't want to. I would just say that if there is an international collaboration, there has to be some common rules. Yes. It's like for intellectual properties. If you have collaboration with an industrial, yeah. then you, you need to define the rules. So I, I think there is certainly a way <laughs> to share uh, the data uh, uh, inside an international collaboration. Thanks. That was to the point. Now, um, Akhilesh, you already you always uh, pointed out the role of, uh, I mean, the impact of uh, open science on uh, social sciences and humanities and books. And things. there's one question you may you may like to really like. I mean, you want to address this. Do we have? This is a long question. I don't know how you know how, you, how we'll handle this. Do we have any information? on age or gender and geographical distribution wise statistics on the groups of researchers whose work is most impacted by closed science policies being practiced as of now 
and who are the ones who get most of the benefits? It's a, the question was longer. Um, I, I took. No, I, I got the, uh, got yes. the question. So uh, yeah, we do have a database uh, for the researcher country. Uh, uh, not exactly this way, uh, mm. like for example, not the way that you know how whether we have not done any very detailed assessment of the impact of researcher, uh, but we do have some general database on the thing. But I think this is a good idea. Uh, we can initiate that to uh, figure out how and what impact the in, in, the individual segment. We have a data on institutions. What institution need impact, but individual uh, data is there, but you know, not, I think, very, not very well organized. Data is already there. Some, uh, in terms of, for example, cumulative impact chapter, citation index, these are already there. And they are part of the, uh, uh, you know, web science. But I think we need a more holistic picture. That yes. Thank you very much. And now I'm, I'm really, I have to close the session. I mean, we have so many questions to, to address and thank you very much. Please allow me to thank each one of you. You have been really great. And uh, I thank all of you uh, panelists for sharing your views. And what is more important, it's not just talking for one hour and going away. I really would like to catch on this and then see how we can extract what you said to take this forward towards constructive collaboration between Europe and India. Obviously, France is there. Thank you very much once again and have a pleasant evening. I'm so sorry that we bypassed a little a few minutes. Thank you very much, Kasturi. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And our panel members for this very engaging uh, session. We will now move on uh, to the next panel discussion, which is on health and science. COVID-19 has not only been the century's largest public health emergency, but also a communication crisis. History tells us that an informed, activated population is vital to protecting uh, the public's health. In this session on health and society, our experts will explore the theme of scientific communication from the laboratory to society to understand the major issues, the technologies used, and the progress made to promote better acceptance of measures and increase confidence in them, for example, in, in medical innovations. To initiate the dialogue on the subtleties of bridging health and society, we, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Siddharth Kankaria, Communications and Program Coordinator at Simone Center, NCBS Bangalore, who will moderate the session. Mr. Kankaria, over to you. <laughs>